13. For ye have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Notice that's a time past. Every one of us has a time past, and time present, and time future. I trust that your past wasn't as bad as Paul's. I hope your future will be as good as Paul's later after it was his future. Amen. So, but you've heard of my conversation. Persecuted the church. At present, continuous, uh, continuously persecuting the church of God and also continuing to waste it. It's amazing indeed what happens in those situations. It's a bad situation indeed. Uh, for instance, here's some of the verses that have to do with that. Uh, in Acts 22, 3, for example, I verily was a man of a, a Jew born in Tarsus, city in Cilicia, brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the perfect manner of the law of our fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. He was a Jew that was a good Jew, a very prosperous Jew, a very well-educated Jew, and I persecuted this way, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Uh, Pastor Dan, you can open up the kitchen. If you want to take... Uh, uh, Lorraine, if you want to take him in the kitchen, you can. But Pastor Dan, maybe he'll listen in there if you want. Uh, so I see he's a little bit wiggly, <laughs> as all of us were in our, at that age. <laughs> also, the high priest uh, doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom I also received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus, to bring them which were there, bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. But for the Christians, those Christians that were there in Jerusalem. And then Acts 26, verse 9. I barely thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He wanted to be against the Lord Jesus, and he was. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. Many of the saints that I shut up in prison. So how do you like to be shut up in prison? by a man like Paul, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, kill them, I gave my voice against them. He was in favor of killing them. He's a conspirator for murder. He's a murderer himself. That's the definition of conspiracy. He was for them, put to death. And I punished them, not just once in a while, oft, in every synagogue. That's where the Christians met in those days, in the synagogues, even though they were Christians, not Jews. I exceeded being exceedingly and compelled them to blaspheme. If you don't blaspheme the Lord against them, I'll kill you or something else. And being exceedingly mad against them, furiously mad. I persecuted them even in the strange cities. It wasn't just in a few cities, but all kinds of them. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, that was what he did. He went and killed others. Then in First Corinthians fifteen, verse nine. I am the least of the apostles, and not meant to be called apostle. I persecuted the church of God. And then in Galatians 1.23, uh, they had heard only, these Galatians, that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which he once destroyed. In Philippians 3, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. That was his zealous Situation. Let's read verse number 14 together. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals, my own section, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. He was zealous for the tradition. He profited. He was a great Pharisee. He was great among my equals. Above the equals, he was high, one of the high Jews in the Pharisaical system. Exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Now, we've got to be careful of man's tradition. Forget it. But God's tradition, some of the things in here, the traditions of the Word of God, keep them. Don't throw them out. But the traditions of the people that are unsaved and unbelievers, family traditions, don't keep them. He was keep to keeping the old zealous uh, traditions of his fathers in, in the Jewish religion. And he was zealous, for instance, in Acts 22, and verse 3. I barely was a man that was a Jew born in Tarsus, city of Cilicia, uh, brought up in this city, the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a wonderful matchless teacher. And Cilicia, you want to get that Cilicia? It's over in this place here. Uh, Cilicia right here. That green part right there. That's where he was from. Cilicia brought up and caught up at that place. And Cilicia, prophet of my own religion. And 
yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamil, taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, zealous toward God. In Philippians 3, verse 4, though, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath, wherewith he may trust in the flesh, I am more. Then he brags about himself. Hebrew of a Hebrew, uh, tribe of Benjamin, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless, but the things which were gained to me, I kind of lost for Christ. I wonder if we can do that for our past that we used to uh, be very proud of, for the Christians who are generally saved, can we say that count them as refuge? Let's read verse number 15 together. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. They say now a miracle of his salvation. A man that hated Christ more than anyone probably in his age, or as much as anyone, a miracle. God spoke to him and on the road to Damascus, or Emmaus, I guess it was, no, Damascus. On the road to Damascus, the Lord spoke to him and sir, what must I do to be saved? Was a, what, what, uh, Lord, <laughs> no, that was a, Philip's question, but he said, uh, on the road to Damascus, uh, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Uh, who art thou? And so on. So he trusted the Lord Jesus as his Savior on that occasion and was changed and saved and glorified the Lord. Let's read verse number 15 together. 16. 16, uh, 16 yes. Did you read 15 already? Yes. Okay. Paul called to preach. Let me get to Romans 1 1. Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, separated from the gospel of God. He was called by the Lord Jesus Christ. And many people confuse Matthias as the twelfth apostle, called and elected by the apostles. But Paul was called by the Lord Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus, the ninth chapter of Acts. And he is the true successor of the, true, uh, the Judas betrayal, the traitor, Judas Iscariot. Then in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 1, Paul, again, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. All right, let's read verse number 16 together. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I confer not with flesh and blood. He didn't have to confer with flesh and blood. The Lord Jesus Christ taught him three years of the Arabian desert. But notice, he called him in order to reveal his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in me. And I might preach him, the Lord Jesus. Uh, not tell, tell stories, nothing, but to preach the Lord Jesus Christ and all that concerns him. His deity, his virgin birth, his blood of Tom on the cross of Calvary, his miracles, everything about the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is what we have a few more verse, few verses here on preaching Christ uh, that Paul did in Acts 10, and verse 36. God, when, which, when the word which God sent. Peter speaking, now to the children of, of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. Peter preached Christ, and that's what we've got to do. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the preaching subject that we should maintain. In Acts 11, verse 20, again Peter speaking, speak unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the theme of the preaching. It should be the theme, not of the modernistic apostate churches, but that should be our theme, preaching Jesus Christ. Then in Romans 16, verse 25, now to him that is a power to establish you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. In the church of Corinth, or Rome rather, they needed Christ to be preached to them. Then in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. We know that. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. Preaching the cross. That's what we got to preach as well. In 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 14, he says, well, we reached yet unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Came all the way to First Corinthians in a Corinth, and that town to preach the gospel. And then in First Corinthians one, verse twenty-three, we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. And then in Second Corinthians two and verse twelve, uh, he came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel. Now, this is his ministry to preach the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his deity and miracles is coming again, uh, the millennial reign, all that concerned the Savior. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Not boasting what you did and I did, what the preachers did, different ones. That wasn't his purpose to boast. And then in Ephesians 3 and verse 8, 
unto me, blessed and least of the saints is this grace, grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable riches. He's got plenty of riches, but they're unsearchable. We don't have them all in the Scriptures. We've got many of them in the Scriptures. But they go well beyond the Scriptures. Unsearchable riches of Christ. That's what he preached. In Colossians 1, 27. To whom God would make known the riches of his glory by the mystery which among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We'll talk about some verses a little bit later on being in Christ. Very important verses. Let's read verse number 17 together. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Arabia, down south, it's in, it's in the African situation, uh, but then he went back to Damascus, which is up in here, after he went to uh, Arabia. And in Arabia, uh, he t- was taught by the Lord Jesus some three years. Three years, as the apostles were taught three years or so, he was taught three years, and things that the, the apostles didn't learn, didn't teach. Uh, he didn't teach these apostles some of these doctrines, but Paul had a distinctive ministry because he was taught distinctively of the Lord Jesus Christ, about the church and other things as well. Uh, he went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. So that was something. And then abode with him 15 days. He certainly talked about things, I'm sure, and I'm sure that Paul had many things that Peter did not know, was not taught by the Lord Jesus in the upper room. Let's read verse number 19 together. But other of the apostles, I saw none, said James, the Lord's brother. So he saw Peter and James, but he didn't receive the gospel by men. He didn't was untaught it by man, nothing to do with men. It was a different situation. And uh, he didn't see people to see what should I preach now, but the Lord told him what to preach and what to believe. Let's read number 20 together. Now the things which I write unto you, behold before God, I know not. It's a wonder that he says that about that, but I guess some people would doubt Paul and say that he was a liar. and So he just puts it right on here. Before God, I lie not. And all the things about my early life, the time past, as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, that's not a lie. And persecuting the church, that's not a lie. And all the details of it, I lie not. And the conversion in Acts chapter 9, as the Lord Jesus spoke to him and met him and talked to him, and Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now this was not anything lying, it was true indeed. Let's read verse number 21 together. Afterwards, I came unto the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Syria and Cilicia, uh, that's over here in this area. Cilicia, uh, Cilicia is up here, and Syria is somewhere along this line here. Syria, he went to that area, and Syria right here. That's Syria. Uh, he went into these regions of Syria and the region of Galatia as well. And then uh, he was a traveler. He didn't just stay in one place, didn't stay in Jerusalem only, but as the Lord led him, remember he had three missionary journeys. And the fourth missionary journey was a missionary journey. He wasn't called that to Rome as a prisoner. And he spoke to the prisoners, and he was used of the Lord even in that. Let's read verse number 22 together. And it was unknown by faith unto the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. That's in the Bethlehem. Jerusalem area, the church of Judea. Now notice the churches which were in Christ. There are many churches in this land, many churches in this city, in this country, in this state. But these were churches that were in Christ. Genuine Christians, genuinely saved. I want to take a few verses to show that on this in Christ and what it means in the New Testament, our position. By the way, that expression in Christ is used 76 times in the New Testament. 76 times. Being in Christ means they're genuinely saved. Not hip- hypocrites, not people say they're Christian in quotes <coughs> in the head, but they're not genuine Christians in the heart. Lost, bound for hell. No, in Christ means they're genuine saved Christians. In Romans 8 and verse 1, we know that one. Let's say it together. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. They're in Christ, genuinely saved. In Romans 12, verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ. Genuine Christians are in Christ. And then in Romans 16 and verse 7, uh, salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, 
my fellow prisoners, for who are of note among the apostles, and also were in Christ before me, in Christ, genuinely saved, before I was. And then uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 18 and 19, uh, they which are also fallen asleep in Christ, saved, genuine people, dead, but they're in Christ before they die, uh, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Again, hope in Christ saved, that's all we have. But we have a Savior, and that's a wonderful gift indeed. Then in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22, another instance of this, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. In Christ we're made alive by genuine faith. If you have a genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're dead in your sins. You're bound for hell, not for heaven. You must be in Christ. You'll be all be made alive. And then in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, we know this one, let's say this one together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. They all things are become new. In Christ, new creature. Old things are passed away. At least, that God does not hold us for our times past of the old things. Passed away in God's eyes. New creature. We ought to act like new creature. In Christ, genuinely saved. Another verse on this, Galatians 3, in verse 28. <clears throat> there are neither Jew or Greek or bond or free. There is neither male or female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean there's a male and female distinction. In Christ, there's no distinction. We're in Christ. We don't go to, by race or creed or color or, or nationality or whether we're male, females or whatever. But in Christ, genuinely saved. Then Ephesians 1 and verse 3. <clears throat> <clears throat> blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. If you're in Christ, you have heavenly blessings. If you're not in Christ, not saved, not a genuine Christian, no blessings, curses, you'll be lost and bound for hell. Be sure you trust Him as your Savior in the heart, not simply the head. And then Ephesians 2 and verse 6. <clears throat> Perhaps you know this one also. <clears throat> Man hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we have heavenly places that we're there with the Lord, and the blessings are ours, only those genuine Christians. And then in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, uh, we know this one, I think. For we are in his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Created in Christ Jesus. Those that are genuinely saved, and only those genuine Christians are in Christ Jesus. And after that, we should do good works after we're in Christ and saved. Not to be saved, but after we're saved. And then Ephesians 2, verse 13. <clears throat> but now in Christ Jesus, you sometimes were far off, are made nigh to the blood of Christ. We're made near to God, to God if we're in Christ Jesus. Genuinely saved. Born again. Not just professors, but possessors of salvation. Then finally, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. We know this one. Let's say it together. For the Lord Jesus and the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with his voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Only the dead in Christ. The lost ones will stay in their graves, and there's going to be a resurrection of the lost ones, and they will be sent to the lake of fire. Right now they're in Hades, <clears throat> they're going to be sent to the lake of fire, but those in Christ shall rise first, those that are genuine Christians. Let's read verse number 23 together. <clears throat> but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. Again, this is what he preached. The earlier verses we talked about he preached Christ. Now here he preaches the faith. <clears throat> That's the subject matter of all preachers, or should be. It's not with many preachers, sad to say, but it should be. For instance, in Acts 9 and verse 20, they knew that he persecuted Christians. Now he preaches the faith he was destroyed. Straightway, he that is Paul, <clears throat> preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Preaching Christ because he's now saved. That's a good subject. That's a subject that all preachers should preach. The Lord Jesus Christ and all of his attributes. Then in Acts 9 and verse 26, <clears throat> Saul was come to Jerusalem. He said to join himself unto the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. I'd be afraid of him too. He's one to put the Christians in prison and persecuted them and 
and made them blaspheme, they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, that is the way to Damascus, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. That was his preaching, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was a preacher. Then in Acts 13, and verse 5, <clears throat> when they were at Salamis, maybe we should shut that door, honey. maybe shut that back door so we don't have too much uh, screaming. <clears throat> when they were at Salamis, they, that is Barnabas and Saul, preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their ministry. Preach the word of God. The preaching should be the word of God in the scriptures. It should be the right word of God. In English language, it's the King James Bible. Why? Amen. Because it's based upon the, the, the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words that underlie it. And those words have been preserved for us, and the King James Bible has translated them accurately. The other versions, these modern versions, uh, have used other bases, and they're not proper, uh, especially the ones that... Now, the New King James professes to follow the text of Shepherd. It doesn't follow. I found three places just by accident. Another man looked it up, 100 to 150 places where it doesn't. <clears throat> but of course, the translation, even of the manuscripts that are text receptors, are fallacious and many times crooked and strange and different. But the other version of the English language, uh, everyone that's recently come out, there are 8,000 differences between their text of the New Testament alone and the text receptors that underlies the King James Bible. <clears throat> of those 8,000, many of them, you can't even tell the difference, but 356 of them are doctrinal differences. Doctrines are involved, very important doctrines. <clears throat> we, we heard of a person, a family, <clears throat> that used to attend our services here, and uh, all of a sudden they're no longer here. But one of the things that was mentioned to these people, that uh, they don't like the King James Bible, they prefer the New American Standard Bible, for example, and that New American Standard has these 356 doctrinal perversions. For, for instance, in Philippians 4.13, the Bible says, and the Greek says, I can, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And not these Gnostic, critical Greek texts. They say, I can do all things through the one that strengthens me, leave out Christ. These are a lot of things, definitely different. But Paul preached the Word of God, very important. And then in Acts 13, verse 42, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them by Paul the next Sabbath. He preached the word uh, in, in there in the book of Acts. And then in Acts 14, verse 7, they were in Lystra and Iconium, round about. They preached the gospel. And preaching the word of God, preaching the Lord Jesus and the gospel, was the thing that Paul did, and which all preachers should do as well. Let's read verse number uh Number is it? Number 24. Yes. Yeah. And they glorified God in me. The people to whom he preached the gospel glorified God because of Paul, through Paul, because his ministry was clear, it was to the point, and there's nothing to, against it, nothing was inappropriate in any way. They thanked the Lord and praised God because of Paul's ministry to him. And so these, this purpose of Paul as he was saved, he was a terrible persecutor. He was a terrible hater of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he told, told Christians to blaspheme his name, put them in prison. When they were killed, he consented unto their death. He was a murderer by extension, and a terrible man. But he met the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the first thing that every one of us here should do if we've never done it before. Those listening by the internet, same way. And once he believed in the Lord Jesus and was converted, many people didn't believe him. He said, how can this blasphemer of, of Christ, how can this people that put Christians in prison, why do you want to follow him? Why do you want to have anything to do with him? And someone had to straighten them all out. Yes, that was Paul in the past. But this is Paul in the present. Every one of you has a past. You have a present. You have a future. What was your past like? A lot of things you did, I did in the, in the past, were not pleasant to the Lord. But if we're saved and genuinely Christians, we have a present. I trust that this new year, uh, 2017, you'll be bold and read the scriptures through from Genesis to Revelation, starting today. It can be done. I know that that's what my pastor told me when I was first saved. Went in the church on January, uh, I think it was 19, 
what was the date on it, honey? 40, 48, 48, 49, something like that. He said to us, and I was just a new Christian, he said, I want every one of you, by the end of this year, whatever year it was, to read your Bible through from Genesis to Revelation. That was the pastor, what he said to us, new Christians and so on, other people, old Christians as well. And I went to my man, Brother Sanborn, who became my father-in-law, and it wasn't at that time. I said, how are you going to do that? He's been a Christian for 60 years, whatever. He said, I don't know. So I've had to figure it out. So I looked in the Bible that was given to me by the janitor of our high school, Korea High School. Our, uh, Uncle Charlie Allen was his name. When I was saved, he gave me a Bible, came to his Bible. And uh, in fact, that Bible was used of the Lord to introduce me to my first Christian that I ever met in my life. She's sitting in the back row today. My wife, Yvonne Sandborn, was her name before. And the Sandborns and the weights were close in lockers. So as I went to put that Bible in the locker so nobody would see me, you know, I was shocked. <laughs> she was right there. And so to my right, where'd you get that Bible? Uh, well, she didn't call me. I guess she said, where did you get that Bible? Nice tone and everything. I, I told her I got it from Uncle Charlie Allen. I'm his first. She said, first what? I was the first Christian that ever led to Christ in that school. Are you saved? Yes. Are you born again? Yes. Are you a genuine Christian? Yes. She asked me all the questions. First Christian I ever met in my life. Genuine Christian. I went to church in the Methodist church that didn't preach the gospel. It was a modernist apostate church. But the first genuine Christian. I never thought I would marry her, but that was in, uh, let's see, we were seniors. We were seniors at that time. And uh, 1945. seniors. And so, but the point of it is, I took Uncle Charlie's Bible, and I looked at it in there. It's a wonderful Bible. I still have it upstairs. It has every book, Genesis, the number of verses in the Bible, that book, the number of chapters in that book, all the way through the Bible. Then it has the total number of verses and chapters in the Old Testament, total verses and chapters in the New Testament. You add them all up, you get over 30,000 verses. So I simply took my slide rule and divided 30. 365 into 31,000, whatever the number, I came out with 85 verses. So I had to figure out myself how to do it. I've been doing it ever since when I was saved at the age of 16. And I was 17, it was a new year, so I turned to like six, I guess I was maybe 17 when I went to that. From that day to this, sometimes I used to read in the beginning one or two uh, times through, but every day from that time, it have been a number of years. I've been reading that, and you say, well, why, the first question people ask, why should I read the Bible again if I read it already? Well, because every day you and I are different people, and every day you find in the Word of God different things that you need for that day. Daily bread, that's what it is, it's daily food. And then you say, well, <clears throat> what if I don't understand it? Well, there are many things in the Scripture, Genesis and Revelation, as I read these all these different years, 1944, 45 to this present. I don't understand everything. Few things, but each time I read it again, I understand more about the things I didn't understand the first time I read it, the second or third or fourth or fifth, or fifty or sixty times. So you need it. It's good for you. It'll help you, but you have to believe it, and then you have to practice what it teaches you. That's another thing. Not simply knowing, but it's following and practicing the scriptures. So I urge you to do that. And Paul was a fervent preacher of the Word of God everywhere he went. He knew the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures. He wrote letters to the churches in Ephesus and Galatia and Thessalonica and Corinth and all these other places and taught them the Scriptures. That's what we have today. And we have that thing. And if you want to have these uh, verses and so on so you can listen to them on the DVD, right, you go out the door right there about your right-hand side, you find... DVD cassettes. The first DVD on there, DVD, is reading. I read the scripture here, Genesis to Revelation. You can listen to it as you read it. The second disc on there is comments on these 85 verses. I sum up the 85 verses we read for that day. So if you want to be helped with this, as you go on the right side, pick those little DVDs up. They're free. They cost money, but to you they're free, absolutely free, and it will help you to understand and to be faithful in reading the scriptures. Let's close with a word of prayer. We thank thee, Lord, for our Savior. We thank thee for thy word. 
We thank thee for these who have joined us this morning for our services. We ask thee, Lord, that thou wouldst use us to thy glory. We thank thee that we can preach Christ if we're genuinely saved. We can talk about him. And we thank thee we can read thy word. And as we read it, help us to understand it and to follow it and guide us by the Holy Spirit that we may do what thou wouldst want us to do and all that is upon us. Give us grace and glory. Help those of us who are here and still able to come to our afternoon service. May they come to our one thirty service and be edified and as the Lord Jesus is taught there in the book of Mark. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's take our